on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Lehman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We talk some Baker Mayfield and the 34 new faces in Norman. Then Jeff Schwartz joins us to talk some NFL playoffs. And we finish giving you our winners and losers of the week. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, January 17th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of January, all you got to do is visit riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now recording this Wednesday morning, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. Ted Lehman, how are we doing, sir? Fantastic. I cannot complain. we got plenty of good stuff going on, a lot to talk about, so uh, lots is good. Yeah, we've got Jeff Schwartz to talk some NFL playoffs. This is the time of the year we where we dive into the NFL a little more, but like we always do, we're going to start with OU football stuff. Now, Ted, when I put the rundown together, I always think, what is the number one thing that OU fans, OU football fans, want us to talk about first on the podcast? That is always my first thought, and that is what I put I put at the start of the podcast when I'm putting the rundown together. And I was going back and forth, and honestly, man, I think OU football fans want to talk about Baker Mayfield. Yeah, because there are few things that get the OU fan base more fired up than when Baker Mayfield is cooking. And I still believe he's the most popular OU player of my lifetime. I don't think it's even close, really. And Baker and the Bucks just a dominant win over the Eagles the other night. And, and Baker came into that game with some injuries, but, Ted, he looked... He looked good, man. He he looked like he was playing with that confidence, that swag, that edge, whatever you want to call it. It was it, it remains for me, and I think for many people that listen to this podcast, it remains one of the most entertaining things in sports when he's playing at a high level. Yeah, I I agree 100%. He's whenever he is confident, Man, he's fun to watch, and uh, it, it, I don't. It's like watching a. I don't know. He's he's an entertainer, and it's fun. And I'm glad that he's having a lot of success. He, you know, he's. It's been a rough go here the last couple of years. It has not been easy, but he's continued to grind, continue to work. Um, you know, I was worried whenever he had the rib stuff going on. I was like, oh my gosh. Is he going to be out there in a ton of pain trying to fight through? And is it going to cost him like it did previously whenever he played through the shoulder stuff? And he looked great. And I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a, you could think of a couple of different instances, but that game specifically might have made Baker Mayfield more money than any single one game that you've witnessed in, in the NFL in a long time. And he's, he's not making a whole lot this year. He's on that, that one year deal. And I, you got a playoff win. You got to sign him back if you're Tampa and the price is going up. There's no doubt. And, and this is something we've talked about, but I continue to wonder what that price is going to be what the contract is going to look like. And so I was looking at some of the QB salaries. He can't take less than Geno Smith. 
he what can't he take like less than Jimmy G. Yeah, Geno Smith made twenty five million dollars this year. Yeah, Baker's base salary was four. Now he's made nearly three million dollars in incentives because he's played well in the Bucks are winning right, and they won a playoff game. But I don't think he. I don't think he takes anything less than twenty five. I don't know why he would. And that was the thing. And I, and I know Jalen hurts is, is banged up. Right? And there seems to be some interesting team chemistry things going on in Philly. Yeah. Yeah. But Jalen hurts made $51 million this year. Woo. So you put it in Baker Mayfield completely outplayed him in that game. So I just don't know. Man, I, I don't know. I know the Bucks have to bring several guys back. Uh, they got some big, uh, you know, some big time players that are going to be free agents for them. But it looks good. It looks good with Baker running the show down there, and what that contract ends up looking like, I'm not sure. Something in my head, it looks something like three for ninety. But yeah. we'll see. Maybe I'm underselling the guy. Yeah, I think it's good. I think you're right. I think it's going to be on the shorter end. Um, I, I, whenever you look at the the quarterbacks out there and how much they're making, and you look at the season he's had, I mean, it, it's easy to put him in the thirty five million dollar a year range. Easy. It's not that hard at all. Um, but that's pretty much when you get into about the top 15 quarterbacks, you're talking about $35 million a year, which is crazy, but you know, that that's where things have gone. My, my one question is like, what is the market for him outside of Tampa? Like, cause that's really what's going to drive his price is Tampa will say, well, we can pay this because no one else will pay that. And I don't know what, what that is on the open market because I, you, you either want to be really good at quarterback or you want to be bad enough to where you can draft one in the top 10. So I, who, who, how many people does that leave out there? I don't know, but. It, needless to say, he's going to make a bunch of money, and I hope he makes all of the money. That's awesome. I'm I'm proud of him, man. It's 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 fun to see him doing well. It is, and he bet on himself going there. I'm sure he had plenty of options to go be a backup somewhere, and just throw his hands up and say, you know what. It it just wasn't meant to be. I'm a backup guy the rest of my years in this league. But it, it felt like it was it was his last chance out of the tipping point. Yeah. I, I think it. it really was. And for him to say, you know what? Got a chance to be a starter in Tampa. And all, all I gotta do is beat out Kyle Trask. And he did it and he's excelled. And I and think that may that, not be done. They may not be done. And they may not be done. I mean, they look good. Now, Philly is, I don't know what's going on with that team. And I hated i hated seeing Lane's season end in a loss like that. But, man, I, I've said this so many times, I'll continue to say it. The NFL, it, it's just more fun with Baker Mayfield. And it's more fun when Baker Mayfield is out there slinging it and playing well. Yeah. It's an entertainment product, man. And there are few players that when they have it rolling, there are few players that are as, an inter as entertaining as Baker. Yep. Yeah, I agree. All eyes on Baker whenever he's got it going. You can't, you can't take your eyes off him, whether he's on the sideline or out there on the field, post-game, pre-game. He's, uh, he's a fun guy to watch, man. 337 yards, three touchdowns. And a couple of big time drops. One early from Mike Evans. Probably would have been close to 400. Yeah. Without those drops. And maybe, maybe Mike Evans scores there and he ends up with the four touchdown game. 
he was he was great. Did Philly's just god awful tackling help things? Absolutely. But he was the best quarterback in that game. Yeah. I, I think anyone with eyes would say, yeah, absolutely. The guy that was that was playing quarterback for Tampa was better than the guy playing quarterback for Philly, which Hertz has been He's been really good when he's been healthy. I, I don't know exactly what's going on with him, but Baker was head and shoulders the better quarterback in that game. Yeah, and he's got a matchup. Like, Goff is uh, – he's a good, solid quarterback, but, you know, he's not, he's not a top five guy. You know, so – I mean, there's a chance that he can he can go into Detroit and outduel Jared Goff, and you know if you could do that, who knows? You know, you got the 49ers and the Packers, Brock Purdy and and Love. Now Love looked amazing against the Dallas Cowboys. Can they replicate that against the 49ers? No, but uh, you can't count them out of the football game. I guess what I'm saying is. They got a ch- they got a chance to to take this thing pretty far, possibly. Just have to see how it goes, and hopefully he can keep it rolling. I I think we're all excited to watch. Now, did did you see the cri- the clip, like the NFL film style clip of his last touchdown to Chris Godwin? No. So it's basically him. They're they're bringing zero. Billy's bringing zero. And it's basically him telling Chris Godwin, like, hey, be ready. He knows exactly what's coming. He floats it up there. Was it the best throw in the world? No, but, like, he knows he's down there somewhere, and he even says that. He runs down the field. He's sure, and he knocks a tight end over as he chest bumps him, which was pretty funny. And then he gets to Godwin, and he's like, he's down there somewhere. <laughs> and it just it, – it just – I contrasted that with what I what I watched from Tua in person. Yeah. A lot of those snaps, Tua when that when Kansas City was bringing pressure in that game, it's like he had no idea it was coming. And Baker clearly, you know, from the the mental side of things, he he's got that as well. So that that was just a glimpse of man when he's got it rolling when he's healthy. He's a good player. He's a really good player, and I'm I'm just I'm really excited that he's having the type of success that he's having this year. Because let's be real, man. All the different coaches, all the different coordinators, the way that things went down, the way that things ended in Cleveland, uh, the stint in Carolina. It did not feel like, you know, the trajectory of his career was downward. Yeah. And he has risen like a phoenix from the ashes, baby. It's it's just, it's really, really enjoyable for me to watch. It's the, it's the perfect uh, Baker Mayfield story, isn't it? I mean, he's, the guy's always bet on himself. You know, he bet on himself whenever he, he left tech walked up to coach stoops and said, I want to walk on here, <laughs> whatever, uh, you know, OU had just beaten Alabama in the sugar bowl and Trevor and I had the game of his life and he still walked on campus and said, yeah, this, I think this is where I want to play. And you know, the rest is history. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just anxious to be on the ride and see how far it goes. I hear you. I, I saw this tweet from Dane Brugler. Baker Mayfield in three career playoff starts, two and one, seven touchdowns, one interception, 804 passing yards. Mm. It's about what you do when the stage is biggest and the lights are brightest. Pretty impressive, man. If I remember right, he had the Chiefs beat, but what the reaching into the end zone touchback, right? Mm. And that what got him beat. Mm. Oh, brutal. We'll see. We'll see what it looks like against Detroit, but uh, I think we're we're just all fired up for Baker. It's yep. it's fun. It's fun. All right, now shifting to current OU Sooners. 
34 new faces on campus in Norman. Let's start with the transfers, Ted. We've got tight end Bauer Sharp, defensive end Caden Woolard. I think that's how you say it. I, I still am not 100% sure. Uh, quarterback Casey Thompson, wide receiver Deion Burks, defensive back Des Malone, offensive lineman Fabechi Wewu. Nailed it. Tied in Jake Roberts, defensive back Jocelyn Malaska, offensive lineman Michael Tarquin, running back Sam Franklin, offensive lineman Spencer Brown, and a kicker, Tyler Keltner. When you look at the the transfers that are in Norman already, Ted, and maybe they end up adding some more with with some of these coaching changes that have that have taken place and some of the 30-day windows that have been triggered, but when you look at the transfers they have in Norman right now, which one gets you the most excited? Well, I, it, it kind of depends on how you frame it. Um, I, I think the guy that is the easiest plug and play going to have the biggest impact from get go is Deion Burks. You know, he's, I, I think he, he'll be, I, I don't know if he'll be a starter right out of the gate, but he's going to be a big contributor right out of the gate uh, for sure. Um, as long as he stays healthy. Uh, and I think that he's, he can go. He looks like he's going to be a really nice piece for our offense. Um, you know, I think Fabechi Wewu from North Texas is, I, I think, He's exciting. I feel like he can do some good stuff, and there's a, a pretty high percentage chance he finds his way into that that starting five somewhere on the offensive line. But the guys that I think have a chance to really maybe come out of nowhere and change things for us are Bauer Sharp and Woolard, the, the edge guy. Those are two position groups where we have to have somebody make something happen. All right. Burks at receiver, you know, you can never have too many guys, but I, we got some good talent at wide receiver. Um, all right. The tight end position group needed something to happen in a big way. And I thought we got a really solid guy in Roberts and then uh, a serious upside, but you really don't know in Bauer Sharp. And it's kind of the same thing with Woolard. He's got really good production, good measurables, and it's a position of need where we need guys that get to the quarterback. We got some guys that I like there, but we need more production. Uh, and he's got some sack numbers. We'll see if he can continue that. But um, I, I keep going back to Bauer Sharp. Really good measurables, good size for the position. And he looks like a pretty dynamic athlete. I am. I'm with you on Sharp. I cannot wait for spring ball to start and, and get to see what he looks like. I'm just. He may be a guy where I walk out there and see him and be like, oh, okay, rotational guy. I, or he may be a guy walk out there and you're like, we got something. Yeah, we just come on here. We're like, guys, prepare yourselves. <laughs> He's incredible. Right. But. I'm interested in what you said about Willard because there are some, there's some really exciting young guys at the edge spot, right? Most notably PJ. And then, you know, if our Mason Thomas can just be healthy. But the thing I like is that Willard's not coming in to play 12 snaps. He, I, I assume he came in thinking, you know what? I got a great chance of being a starter, playing a ton at Oklahoma, similar to what Bothroyd did. And I just love the, the dynamic and competition that creates for some of those young guys that have you know, higher ceilings than Willard's got when you look at the physical traits. So that's, that's one of the dynamics that is created that I really enjoy is that you got this old guy coming in who's got every intention of being a starter or, you know, a heavy rotational guy. And you better elevate yourself. 
you better elevate what you're doing or else you're going to find yourself playing a handful of snaps like you did in the 2023 season. And if you're right, if you're wired the right way, if you're made of the right stuff, you don't let that happen. If you're PJ or our Mason Thomas, mm -hmm. don't let this guy come in and take a bunch of snaps from you. So I, I love, I love the competition that that creates in that room. And I'm sure Miguel Chavis is going to say, Hey guys, whoever practices the best, you're going to get the majority of the snaps and they rotate a lot of guys, but I just, I like that dynamic because I feel like it naturally pushes a couple of those young guys to have to step their stuff up. Now I was pretty, pretty critical of Spencer Brown when he committed. I'll be the first one to admit that I was not blown away with him on tape. He has, he has some technique issues that were glaring on tape, but six, six, 320 pound people don't grow on trees, Ted. Right. And when you look at, when you look at Oklahoma's situation at tackle, they need him whether that is as a starter or that is, you know, as a swing tackle, as your third tackle, whatever. It's, he's going to be, in all likelihood, he's going to be part of the 2D. So that's why when I look at the 12 transfers that are in right now, I'm most intrigued by him. I want to see what he ends up looking like after a winter conditioning session with Schmidt. And I want to see what Bill Bedenbo can do with him from a technique standpoint, because I, I feel like the athleticism there the guy moves plenty well enough to play tackle at a high level, but how quickly can they polish him? Cause he's, he, he's raw. When you watch him, the techniques all over the place, especially with the stance, but for whatever reason, and it, I'm sure it has something to do with him being an offensive lineman. I get really intrigued by guys like that where you watch them and you go, okay, the physical tools are there. The traits are there. It's just not all coming together for some reason. He's one of those guys. When I look at him, I go, okay, how quickly can this staff at Oklahoma put it all together or help him put it all together? And he's 6'6", 315, 320. Need those type of guys going into the SEC. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, you know, I, I, it's going to be a really big off season for some offensive line guys, the transfer guys coming in the, some of the younger guys that were starting to get some reps, um, you know, last season. And frankly, the guys that didn't get reps, some of your red shirt guys and, and guys that haven't, haven't, been in that needed some time to develop. Well, that time is now. And, and hopefully we see some guys that were already on the roster that we haven't talked a lot about. Hopefully we see some of those guys emerge and at least make their way into the two deep and, and add some depth, but perhaps even, you know, surprise some folks and start competing for a starting job. When I look at the 12 transfers that are in, I do wonder how many are going to be starting for this team in 2024. Uh, Birch to me, just watching his highlight reel from Purdue. I'll be surprised if that guy's not one of the first receivers running out on the field. That dude looks dangerous. Agree. You can talk about different personnel groupings, but you would expect Sharp and Roberts both at the tight end position, uh, probably to be considered starters. If you don't have a starter out of one of those two guys, uh -oh. We're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brown, uh, if all things go, uh, if all things go well, you would assume maybe your starter at right tackle Sexton is your starter at left tackle, but I'm not going to pretend I know what the kicking battle is going to look like. So sorry, Keltner. I got, I got nothing for you, man. I, I'm sure you're great. But when you look at those 12 guys, four or five, maybe even more, but probably four or five are going to be starting for you next season. So it's very important that those guys come in and 
start digesting everything and put the work in and get ready to go because this team's going to need them. Yeah, and I'm still, I'm still, I, the Sam Franklin pickup is still fascinating to me at running back. Um, I what Tennessee Martin almost was he the first guy in the port like that they picked up in the portal? He's one of the first, maybe the first. I think it was December fourth. Like whenever I don't know when the portal opened, whatever. But it was right out of the gate, and I'm so fascinated by that because I thought whenever I turned on the Tennessee Martin tape, I was going to see a guy that is just shredding people out there but he, he he's good he's okay i mean he didn't just jump off the film at you which made me wonder like why was that so quick right out of the gate at such a massive position of need i mean you go back and you 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 look at last season and how different it could have gone had we had better play at running back I mean, I don't know what we're talking about. There's, you know, we definitely could have and should have been in the Big 12 championship at a minimum. And outside of that, I don't know. And then, you know, they they grabbed him like instantly out of the transfer portal. I don't know. It was it was just it was kind of weird to me. I'm interested to see what his testing numbers look like coming out of winter. Maybe maybe he's more dynamic than I think he is. Yeah. We'll see. And maybe he just needs you know, a better offensive line in front of him. Yeah, you, you look at the numbers. They're good. But maybe he ends up being being a dude. I, I don't know, but I'm with you. I hope so. I, I watched just, it. We watched the same tape. We sent it to each other. We sent clips back and forth. It was just curious. Like the, It was like right out of the gate. That's the running back that they – they went with. So, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. So, there's those 12 transfers, which means there's 22 early enrollees. Run through them real quick. At quarterback, you got Michael Hawkins, Brennan Zerbrug. At wide receiver, you've got Ivan Carrion and Jacob Jordan, who I don't know a lot about that guy. From South Lake Carroll, uh, don't know a lot about him. And then you've got Zion Kearney, who is very highly recruited, and we know everything about him. A uh, tight end, Devon Mitchell, running back, Xavier Robinson, Carl Albert's finest. Offensive line, you've got Daniel Akinkumi, Eugene Brooks, Isaiah Autry, and Josh Isosa. Defensive line, you've got Danny Okoye, David Stone, Nigel Smith, Jaden Jackson, Wyatt Gilmore. At linebacker, you've got James Nesta. In the secondary, you've got Eli Bowen, Jaden Hardy, Michael Boganowski, who they're going to start at safety, which Definitely intrigues me. Uh, Reggie Powers, and then you've got a kicker, Liam Evans. I'm going to start by saying this. I don't know how the kicker thing's going to work out. I it, I got nothing for you people. But other than that, when you look at all the other guys, Ted, it, it's important to have all these guys in early. You get a head start. But when you look at the list, which guys are you really glad that are in early? Devon Mitchell, first and foremost. Um, one of the biggest position groups of need on the entire team. Um, he looks absolutely looks the part gigantic could run great hands, um, looks tough. And whenever you combine him with the two portal guys that we got, plus, um, you know, we'll see what, what we've got on the roster now with, uh, Benul and those guys, a deck. I'm hoping that tight end is the biggest turnaround position group on the football team uh, next year. So that first and foremost, right there. Um, and then all the guys on the defensive line. I mean, that group, when it just, you know, you know what all those guys can bring to the table. It looks fantastic. Now, some guys are going to fade. Others are going to rise. You you're not sure who that's going to be, but I really like that group. And then, man, just another home run secondary hall, uh, especially at safety. Michael Boganowski 
and Reggie Powers, those two guys are fantastic. So, I mean, to me, if I had to, if I had to narrow it down to just one, Devon Mitchell, um, if I had to narrow it down to a position group, the D line group, right? Like, cause that's, we got to have game changers there. And this is one of the best defensive line holes that we've had in a recruiting class in a long time. Hopefully we have some hits out of there. I'd like for all four of those guys to come out and just click right away and, and find themselves on the field and develop and turn into some killers. Um, but you know, history says that you'll probably get one out of there. Maybe two. Anything more than that is a bonus. So I'm, I'm curious to see what happens with those guys. And you could typically tell pretty early on. Now, all of them are going to develop and get better and get bigger and get stronger and get the technique right and all of those things. But you'll, you should be able to tell fairly quickly if you've got some star power there. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Is it crazy when you look at the defensive line group? Is it crazy that I think that Okoye could have the biggest instant impact? He just, he looks, I, I think he is an older guy. You know, you had the homeschool situation. I think he is an older guy already, but being in this class, he just looks physically developed. Mm -hmm. And not saying that David Stone and Nigel Smith and Jaden Jackson don't, but uh, Okoye just looks a little ahead of schedule for what recruiting class he is in. And you know, when you're talking about defensive line, the first thing is, hey, can you hold up physically? And if you can hold up physically, okay, then then there's the mental aspect of everything. But I think Okoye, to me, looks the most physically ready. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's got great length. He's, he's really strong. You've seen some, uh, some of the weight room numbers out there before. He's got great strength. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, I'm fascinated. Now, if you had to pick one that like David Stone, you hope he comes in right out of the gate and is able to give you an interior pass rush and some explosiveness on the inside. Like, I mean, that's, that's where we're the thinnest right now. Um, you know, we've got some guys that you hope are going to develop on the edge, but um, the interior, we got some guys coming back, which is going to help, but man, some, some explosiveness, some athleticism on the interior could go a long way. No doubt. I also think Eugene Brooks is becoming my guy of this class. Yeah. I think that offensive line group is – has a chance to be fantastic. I, I have all the faith in the world in Bill Bedenbo, uh to develop all these guys, but Eugene Brooks, and, I, and I'm heavily influenced by the fact that he went down and, and played as well as he did in, what was that, the Under Armour All-American game and that throughout that week. That There's no doubt. That is, that's a big factor as to why my expectations have 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 been raised for him but there's there's a there are jobs up for grabs in the interior and i especially think the center job is up for grabs and just the way that he moves kind of the way that he's built the lateral quickness i really want to see him at center and i'm i'm bugging beating bow about it start him at center Start him initially at center. It's the, it, it will force him to learn the offense, right? When you have to make all the calls, it just, you feel the natural pressure. You've got to learn it. And I think he can, I think he can be a high level center. So I'm interested to see, he's going to play all three in spring ball. There's no doubt, but this team as of now, I mean, that starting center job is wide open. We'll see. Troy Everett, Josh Bates, maybe it's Eugene Brooks. I don't know, but I think center could be his quickest path onto the field. Like, would Bill Bedenbo start a true freshman at center? The answer is yes. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I cannot explain to people how little he cares about where you're from, how you were recruited, how many games you've started. He does not care. It is all about what you do on the practice field, what you put on tape, how you are in meetings. It is the ultimate merit-based system. You either earn it or you don't. That's how Bill is. All the other stuff, your NIL dollars, like, doesn't care, man. Does not care. So Eugene Brooks is going to have a chance to get on the field early. And I'm interested to see if at some point in 2024, Oklahoma could be starting a true center or a true freshman at center. I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but I don't think it's the craziest thing in the world if it does happen. We'll see. Yeah. I, if that happens, it, I guess it's not 100%, but it tells you that you got something really special there, you know, um, outside of injury stuff happening, of course. But, I mean, that would be a big, physical, strong center. Um, that would be awesome. Let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys, of the 34 new faces on campus, who are you most excited about? This first one comes from John Williams. He says, Jaden Jackson, hard to find guys that move as quickly as he does at his size. He's going to be a force. Yeah. Uh, he's got the possibility for sure. Uh, I've like a, like a lot of what I've seen from him. Um, you know, I know he's already really strong, but just like all those other guys, you got to get bigger. You got to get stronger, all right? Because it's going to be tough, tough duty on the interior. Technique is going to be a, a massive factor as well, but I'm excited about him. I'm like, he's one of those guys that I think whenever he, he started off as a three-star and maybe he ended up there, but uh, as that as the fall progressed, you heard more and more good things about him. Yeah. I, you know, I played with Danny Sheldon in Cleveland. Similar shape guy. Now, Danny got very heavy, but was so strong and played. You just had some natural leverage. If Jaden Jackson, and he was a first round pick, by the way, if Jaden Jackson could end up being something like that, watch out now. Uh, this other one comes from Sam Philbeck. He said, excited for all the freshmen coming in, but excited to see what transfer Deion Burks can bring to the offense, especially with Drake now gone. So Sam hints it. Burke's possibly taken over in the slot. I, I don't know. I would assume with how talented he is, Emmett Jones is going to want to be able to move him around. But with what he did at Purdue, you don't have to watch many clips to realize, yeah, if you put that guy in the slot, you give him a lot of space to work. Good things are going to happen. I, I'm just excited for Jackson Arnold to have him. Yeah. To just yeah. have a new weapon like that show up. <laughs> that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And assuming you get Andrew Anthony back from the the knee and ready to go and everything's good and, you, you know, he has a good ramp up and, Let's see, that was middle of October, uh, so he's four months in. Probably won't get anything from him in the spring, but he should be full go come training camp time, right? So, no doubt. Um, hopefully, if you get Andrew Anthony, you obviously got Nick Anderson coming back, some good young guys, Burks added in there. I, I will be surprised and pissed if we're talking about a lack of talent or lack of guys in the wide receiver room. I'm with you. All right, let's talk some NFL playoffs with our guy, Jeff Schwartz. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals and can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. 
So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hamore. Celebrate with Schooner All American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit schoonerale.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. And Simple Modern is an Oklahoma drinkware company founded by OU grads. They have fantastic products, and that's why they found tremendous success selling the products at Target, Walmart, Amazon, and simplemodern.com. I use Simple Modern Cups. My wife uses Simple Modern Cups. Our kids use Simple Modern Cups. Their products are for the whole family. And also, if you're a small business owner looking for some marketing swag for current and future customers, they make excellent customized products. Check all of it out at simplemodern.com today. All right, here's the big guy, Jeff Schwartz. It is our pleasure to be joined by a man that is smarter than you. Or at least that's what his podcast title claims. Also, you can hear him on Sirius XM Radio. You can see him on Fox Sports. Jeff Schwartz is in the house. What's going on, big guy? I just saw a, a video on social media that Taylor Swift fans are making tributes to Jason Kelsey on his retirement. Not even Travis Kelsey. They're doing it for Jason, his brother, which he deserves. A, but I don't know how you make a tribute video to an offensive center. Like I don't know how I don't know how that video actually works, but nonetheless, it's... what a world what a world we're in, man. Where we got like Swifties making videos. They just took a bunch of pictures of Jason and made it into like a. I don't, I don't have the audio on, obviously, but they just made it into like a collage. What a world we're in. What a world. It it just needs to be clips of him pulling, getting out on the edge in space, which I believe he's oh, the ocean. best. He's the best oh, center God. in space I've ever seen. And then push push highlights, which <laughs> has to be the most visible part okay. of his life over the last couple of years. Like the you, last thing you want to get good at, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Am, am I allowed to cuss on this show? Is that allowed? You are okay. So Laura Oakham yesterday, um, silent reporter, said that. Um, she talked to Jason Kelsey about the tush push and how he feels. And he said before every tush push, he, he yells, fuck my life. And then they snap the ball and he goes and Jalen hurts confirmed. And I, I gotta say, every time I've seen him, like at the end of a tush push, it, he looks like he's been through hell. I mean, he is basically the spear of that, of that tush push and it will not work without him. And when he retires, it's not going to be the same anymore because he's so good at it. The Buccaneers actually stopped the other night. They finally did what I thought you had to do, which is basically, if you can beat Kelsey to like to burrowing down, you can win. And a guy like on the Bucks got, got under Kelsey and just submarined himself and it stops the whole thing. Um, but that play will not be around as much when Kelsey retires because it's not going to be as good. He's the reason why it works so well. Yeah. And what a what a wild game. I mean, a wild season, rather. The first half of the year, they were nails. And then it kind of fell apart there in the later part of the season. You know, I thought they had a really tough schedule and looked like they got tired. And I I don't know what, what fell apart there the last couple of weeks and then into the playoffs. Um, so a couple of things. One is their coach I don't think is that great. I mean, he's a CEO head coach that – saw a team get worse. Like if you're, if you're not going to coach one side of the ball, your team better be buttoned up, right? You better not have mental mistakes. You better be, be really good on both sides of the ball. Just like X it's plain execution stuff. Right. And you know, he, he hired these coordinators and, and the defense, I mean, Matt Patricia, sure. He's filled in at the end, but the defensive errors they had, I thought the lack of effort was pretty jarring on Monday night. Now they have a bunch of backups. I get that, but still like you can run down the field and try to tackle guys. I mean, that, that, that just takes effort, right? It doesn't take skill to do that. Then offensively, they lost um, Shane Steichen, and the offense has been a wreck this season. Um, a couple of injuries there, obviously, a wide receiver without Brown, but that doesn't excuse sort of the lack of preparation, it looks like, at times on offense where there's no answers for anything, for anything the defense gives you. And I go back to – so Nick Sirianni, 
They beat the Chiefs like eight weeks ago. And if you recall, that video went viral again after their loss of him screaming at the Chiefs fans like, wah, 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 wah. take that, Chiefs. You're like, coach, you're NFL head coach. You're not a meathead that calls into the radio. You know, like, what are you doing, coach? Like, have some maturity. And when your head coach shows a lack of maturity, I'm not really accusing the Eagles of being being immature because then they have a lot of veterans that are not immature. But doesn't it kind of just bleed down into how you prepare, into how into how you process things, how you talk to your team? You're so immature. You're in the huddle screaming in the tunnel, as I say, screaming at Chiefs fans. Like, we don't see any of the high-level coaches, college or NFL, scream at fans after a win. Like, you won the game, buddy. Just take your win and go, 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 go back to Philly. So it's just a lot of things, I think, wrong right now in Philly. And I don't think Sirianni survives this. The Eagles have fired coaches very quickly. Chip Kelly and, you know, Andy Reid had one bad season and was out of there. And obviously Doug Peterson won a Super Bowl for him, was out of there, I think, two years later. So I don't think he survives. It's just, it's not, it, they need someone else. I don't know who that is, but it's not Shane, It's not um, Nick Sirianni. Looking at what we saw throughout the three days on Super Wild Card Weekend, what, what game, like what result surprised you the most? Um, Probably the Packers over the Cowboys. Um. You know, they were seven point underdogs, which I mean, look, that Vegas has the lines for reasons, and sometimes you win them and sometimes you lose them. But they're the youngest offense in the NFL, and they're the fifth youngest team since 1970 to um, you know, to, to be in the playoffs. And they looked not at all at all intimidated by the moment uh, on the road. And look, the Cowboys don't have the best home field advantage as far as like it's not terribly loud in that place compared to other places, but still a road playoff game against a good team that doesn't lose at home ever. They did not look at all. Surprised by the moment, um, and that that impressed me a lot. I think we saw though that this weekend the the difference between a good quarterback and a dynamic quarterback, right? And how much that really matters. You look at C.J. Stroud, and you know, Flacco's older. That's a bad example, but what Stroud could do on the field, right? Even in, the, in Jordan Love and Dak Prescott, I mean, Jordan Love made throws and plays Dak Prescott can only dream of doing. You know, like he just some of those throws he made were really, really high level throws. Obviously, Patrick Mahomes and Tua, right? One guy, it's cold outside, does not matter. One guy, it's cold outside, can't complete any passes. Um, you know, it, it just all around the NFL this weekend, you know, the one was the Stafford golf, where Stafford is a better quarterback than golf, but golf just got it done. He's a better offense. He played extremely well. Um, you look at, you know, Jalen Hurts and Baker Mayfield. Jalen was fine in that game. It wasn't his fault they lost. But really having that dynamic quarterback, man, really sets you apart. And we look at this weekend and it's just, that's what's left. You know, Lamar and Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes and Jordan Love and even Brock Purdy this year has been really outstanding. I mean, there's just a lot of good quarterbacks left for a reason. I, I think one of the matchups for a bunch of reasons, but just seeing that atmosphere there in Detroit was awesome. It didn't feel like the NFL atmosphere uh, down the stretch of that football game, but Bucks and Lions, I mean, Lions got it rolling. They're going to be at home. It's going to be another really good atmosphere for them, but it looked like Tampa Bay found something and got their confidence back a little bit. They didn't necessarily come flying into the playoffs feeling great, but it should be a great matchup. It should be a really a lot of fun. Um, you know, you look at, at the what, how the lines are built, right? Just physical line of scrimmage, trying to just overpower you. But I really do worry about their pass defense. And you look at Baker Mayfield. I can't believe I'm like saying this about Baker Mayfield. I mean, he, they could go in there and throw for a lot of yards um, with with Evans and Godwin. And, say, I mean, I don't... say as many nice things about Baker Mayfield on this podcast I, as you want I, to. I, I forgot it, it it's will make the people. Yeah. It'll make the people I, that listen to it I'm, very happy, Jeff. I mean, he's going to get himself like $35, $40 million this offseason. I, I I don't know how how do you not? That's the going rate for Daniel Jones. Baker Mayfield, Daniel Jones. Um, you know, maybe he does the Geno Smith deal. You know, like a three for a hundred or three for 90, but has the last two years basically voidable. So the team can get out of it if he doesn't play well this season, but I mean, he's just done really well And this game comes down. I think a little bit to like who, who doesn't make the mistake, right? Jared Goff played a mistake free game for the most part against the Rams. If, if Tampa Bay blitzes him and they blitz everyone, they, they, they bring a lot of pressure. If, if Goff makes mistakes, I think mean, the Bucks can win this game. Um, if golf doesn't, I think it'd be hard to beat, to beat the lines in this, in, in, you know, in this atmosphere, you mentioned you know, the bucks, they lost the saints and beat the Panthers nine, nothing in their final two games before the, before the postseason. I also think too, the Eagles are just dead. I mean, they just, it, whoever was playing the Eagles was, was going to beat them th this past weekend. So 
I think you can force forcing golf into mistakes. I to me is going to be the number one reason why the Bucks can win this game. The, the pressure gets to golf, and he's not able to to be, play as efficient as we've seen in the past. What do you think about where the Chiefs are at right now? Clearly, I mean Miami just looked like they were frozen in that weather. Yeah, at Arrowhead, a game that I was at, and I just was very underwhelmed by what Tua put on the field that night, but. Got to go on the road. Yeah. We haven't seen Patrick Mahomes have to go on the road in the playoffs. Every playoff game he's played, it's either been at home or it's been a Super Bowl. Yeah. So what do you what do you think about what you're seeing from the Chiefs heading into the divisional round? I'm going to this game, by the way. Nice. Um, my uh, my wife's cousin's husband. I don't know what you call that. Like, what's the official name for that person? But I hate like it's a long intro to get to huge <laughs> Bills fan. And after he was over watching the game some Monday night, it was like, it booked a ticket immediately to like fly to Buffalo. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll go too. Um, it'd be a lot of fun. I've, I've played there once, never been as a fan. Um, look, the Chiefs, I think people are still sleeping on them a tiny bit because of their offense this season, but their defense is really good. Like really good. It's Super Bowl caliber defense. It's a legit defense. And offensively, I, I would say this every week, like, can they just catch the ball for one game? <laughs> you know, like, can they just... You know, can, can they catch the ball for a game? The 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 Bills. I'm going to pull it up. I had it up earlier. The Bills' um, red zone defense not terribly good, which 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 the Chiefs aren't best in the red zone. I mean, it, it, like this. I think the Chiefs are close to sort of playing the game they need to play to win in Buffalo. It's also worth noting that the Bills are so beat up on defense. They entered this game against Pittsburgh without four linebackers and defensive backs. That's a lot. They left with four more guys hurt. So, like, it's just – and they're all, they have nine guys right now, I just read, day-to-day, day-to-day on defense right now. I mean, that's – if you don't have your starting linebackers and your starting secondary against the Chiefs, I don't care if they catch – they could be open. I mean, yeah, they can they catch the ball, we'll find out. So, I think the Chiefs are in good position here um, to steal this game. And, two guys, you know this, the pressure on Buffalo in this game is going to be intense. You're at home. You get the Chiefs finally at home in the playoffs. All the pressure's on them. They're the favorite. Um, they're the hottest team in the NFL right now. Are they going to be able to withstand playing that atmosphere and that pressure? Josh Allen's better at home than he is on the road, which I think benefits them. Uh, I just want to count the Chiefs out, though. I think people are, are looking at the offense and thinking they can't do anything, and, and they play well against against the Dolphins. So um, it'll be fun, man. I can't wait to go. It's going to be cold. Not as cold as Kansas City was, Gabe. Like, I have my, I have my outfit already set up. I should be fine. Um, just, I I don't think I've driven in traffic to a game in a long time. My patience will be tested for this one. Like I, I don't have no parking situation right now. I'm just going to drive and find a lot, hopefully. We'll see how that goes. Um, I don't know. Well, the, the, everything else is, I got, I, got, I got tickets. I got pretty good tickets. Like I got like 40-yard line on the bill side for like 400 bucks a ticket. It's like lower level. It's not bad, right? No, there are a lot of tickets, it, there are hey, lot of tickets available for this game. I was surprised. I, I'll tell you, when, when I was playing for the Bills, uh, my wife, like my mother-in-law, they came to a game. And when they left, they were like, this is the most fun we've ever had at a yeah. sporting event. It is it is wild. Yeah. It's like it's like a college atmosphere. That's, that's what it is. Uh, there in Orchard am, Park. It's a blast. I'm going to tweet out like Sunday morning, like where the tailgate's at. Just, just like – hopefully find tailgates i'm sure the bills fans will be a con. i'm not doing tables don't get me st- I'm, we're not doing that i'm i'm i want to see you go through a table jeff come on man our insurance is not good enough for that right now <laughs> no we're, we're not doing that i'm off the nfl insurance um no i access to a portable nuclear reactor you could take gabe's outfit that had the what the heated socks heated vest heated wait, everything for, i had a for because i went to the chiefs game and we were sitting outside I'm sorry I had, to sit outside. Sorry. I had a heated heated vest. Yeah. I had heated socks and heated gloves, all battery powered. Yeah, I'm not Fantastic. doing Fantastic. I'm going to do the... I, the I best have a, is the key. Like, keeping the neck warm, oh, game changer. So I have a I have a Carhartt jacket that's negative 40 rated that I bought when I played for the Vikings. So, like, that thing is money. I wore it this morning. It was 14 degrees outside in Charlotte this morning. I would walk my dog. That, that's not a problem. I got, I got the, the long johns. I'm good there. And I'm going to wear the face shield, you know? Yeah. I'm going to have a beanie. Oh, yeah. I'm going to bring a scarf. I'll be fine. I'm going to take the hot hands, put it in my pocket. Here's a, here's a key, guys. I'm telling you right now. Y'all don't know this. 
everyone uses those hot hands, right? That, that keeps your hands warm. You got to put them in your pocket. They don't work if you just hold them. They mm -hmm. work in a confined at environment. You got to put them in your pocket, put your hands in there. I'm, I'll be fine. I'm not worried about it. I, it's not a, that the cold of guy. not just to just, I just, again, like I'm sitting on the bill sideline. I'm going to wear, be wearing my chief's gear. We'll see how it goes. No, oh, good luck to me. Well, uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, any fallout for the chiefs, if they don't win, you know, it's, it's felt weird this year. You know, they're typically the team that has the most fun. Um, it looks like everyone's always engaged. It's, it's, it's got a different feel to it this year. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know. Is you see any changes or anything happening there? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, they sort of lacked accountability, I think, a little bit this season, I felt like. And maybe that's Eric Bienemy leaving and sort of not having that person there to to really because he, you know, we know Eric Bienemy is um no problem speaking up and sort of challenging players. And I think they maybe missed that a little bit this season. The offense is always Andy Reid's. Like that's not gonna change. Um, so maybe they need someone in there that maybe hold the players more accountable, but to be honest, they just need better wide receivers. Look, R Rishi Rice very clearly is the number one guy moving forward. Is he a number one in a regular receiving room? Maybe, maybe he's a two, a, but Kelsey, look, here's the thing. Kelsey's getting older. He's not going to be the same player moving forward. Um, he looked very refreshed against the Dolphins. He had a week off. So, you know, there's some older pieces like Kelsey, you need to add a couple wide receivers, in my opinion. Good draft for that. Great wide receiver draft. Um, at a tight end, I would imagine, at some point in this draft as well. And then, um, you know, you just you run it back with better players, in my opinion, for next season. The disappointing part about this year, though, is wasting that that defense because you don't probably have the same defense next year. Chris Jones will not be there, even though for large periods this year he was not – didn't look like he was even playing anyways. You got to re-side Snee. Like, you have to spend some money to keep some of these guys. You know, Willie Gay is gone. So – I think that's a disappointment this year is, is wasting that Super Bowl caliber defense, the best defense Patrick Mahomes has had. But I just wouldn't count them out, guys. I, I don't think that they're going to go into Buffalo and no-show. So it'd be a pretty fun game, man. It's a two-and-a-half-point spread for a reason. Now now you make me want to find a way to go to that game. Um, maybe Dude. I'll explore that. Maybe I'll explore that this afternoon. Dang, dang you, Schwartz. Now, let's go. Looking at, looking at Houston at Baltimore. Yeah. What do we even do if CJ Stroud goes into Baltimore and lights up the Ravens and they win that game? Like, how do we even react? I mean, the Chiefs will have a home game in the AFC Championship game again for the sixth straight season. That's how that's how that's how we react. No, um, it's interesting. Lamar Jackson is a favorite of seven or more points. Is like one in eight against the spread in his career. They have not played well as in kind of these big favorites in these big moments. Um, the the reaction I think for the Packers and the Texans this weekend is knowing you have your franchise quarterback, which is very powerful to feel as a fan base and really as an organization, right? The, 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 the Texans know, no matter how well he plays or doesn't play this weekend, Stroud's their guy. And you have him on a rookie contract. You don't have that with Jordan Love, at least. So the Texans can just spend the next two years loading up in talent and making that roster as good as possible and making a Super Bowl push. Like, that's what you know. And if Stroud plays well this weekend, you know even better. Like, guys, free agent pitch, like, hey, man, we're going to win a Super Bowl here with this kid if he plays poorly it's a rookie on the road first playoff game like that 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 would feel that that out of, out of place but if he plays well accelerates that time he's a baller man i didn't think he'd be this good coming out of college um and he got to a, with a good head coach a good system the question i think also is their oc might be up for some head, head coaching jobs if that if he leaves and i think we're maybe different feeling for next season but i baltimore with with Jackson has you know they've they've had their moments where they haven't come up as big as they need to in the in in, in the postseason, and I wonder if this is one of those where they're tight early on, um, and Texans are playing free. They have nothing to lose in this game. I think Baltimore does win in the end, but it wouldn't shock me if they lost. You kind of have to prove it to me. You can win these games con uh, consistently. Now Green Bay, uh, you know it, it was strange. I feel like. I almost forgot that Green Bay still had a team this year. It was like they were so <laughs> under the radar. Yeah. And then they go in and just, you know, do what they did against Dallas. And now all of a sudden, you know, I thought San Francisco in the NFC is like clearly the best team and it's everyone else. But after that performance, I mean, they've got to have some serious momentum going into that game. Is there is there any way they pull it off? I think this is the one game where you look at sort of you know, the, the Bucks, Texans, Packers, those three teams that won uh, sort of slight surprises in the way they won, I'd put it like that. 
And the the Packers feel like the one that's going to have a big come down this weekend. I feel like, I mean, the Niners are healthy and that when they're healthy, they're hard to beat um, multiple weeks to prepare for this game. Now they obviously know the system of is going to run on because they run the same, they run the same offense. It just feels like you're walking into a buzzsaw with a healthy Niners team. Um, and the Packers defense guys are still not any good. They, they allowed 32 points. I know they didn't allow many points early in the game, but I think the Niners come out and just sort of do whatever they want to the Packers. Um, Packers are a good story. The Niners are just a much, they're nine with nine point favorites, 10 point favorites for a reason. I mean, and sharp people hit the Niners immediately. They're a really good football team and they're healthy. They're off a bye. The Packers are a great story. Um, but they're back on the road again across the country. I think this is a tough game for for Green Bay um, with their personnel, with what you know the Niners can do. It just feels difficult. Looking at all the matchups in the divisional round this weekend, you are a man that likes to place a wager yeah. for six on, on these games. What bet do you like the best this weekend? Um, I took Niners over 30 and a half points against the Packers. Um, again, this is a Joe Barry defense. Not great. Um, so I think Niners just going to score a bunch of points. They scored 30 points, what, 13 times this season. Um, they score a ton of points when things are right. I also looking at, uh, I took Pacheco over 62 and a half rushing yards against Buffalo. Again, as I mentioned earlier, Buffalo doesn't defend the run terribly well, and they're really injured in linebacker. I think it's going to run for a bunch of yards. And, and look, one way, and you guys know this, to quiet down, a very raucous crowd has run the football, right? Is put that put that on the offensive line and just sort of grind out yards, hit the play action pass, and sort of take the pressure off Mahomes having to be the guy early in the game. I think Pacheco is a perfect guy for that. So those are the two I have I have locked in right now. I would lean Texans plus the points. Um, I think that's just a lot of points to to give a Texas team that can score in that situation. The you know the Lions Bucks one. I don't really have a great feel for that one. Um, Again, I, I think if you take an interception prop, like Jared Goff throwing an interception, Baker Mayfield throwing, I think those are maybe the way to go in those games. Uh, all those num- all those numbers aren't really up quite yet. Um, those are the, kind of how I'm leaning so far in, in these games. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be fun. Um, I, what does it mean if Detroit's able to pull it off against Tampa Bay Ooh. during the NFC Championship? I mean, what type of – oh, it's crazy with Campbell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we have to reevaluate sort of how we look at coaches, right? I mean, everyone looked at Campbell, like big giant meathead. Um, I don't know. It's a good coach. I, <laughs> I, I think the, the way they built the team is awesome, right? I mean, when you focus on the trenches and you hit home runs, you're going to be good. You know, Panay Sewell, all pro, right? I mean, third year, all pro Hutchinson owns Enrique inside, Ragnall is close to being all he was all I think second team all pro this year, right? At center. Um they just they just have built inside out. I know we we mocked them for drafting Gibbs and Campbell, but those turned out to be really good draft picks for them. Jameson Williams, they got obviously cheap last year off that injury. Uh he's a contributor. Amon Ron Saber. I mean, they just have done a good job building. I know St. Brown wasn't, I think, a Campbell draft pick, but um and they play football not the right way, but they try to win. They try to beat you up. They play, I think smart analytically, which is important in this, in this day and age. I think that, yeah, you can, the fourth and seven, you know, or for the, sorry, not the fourth and seven, the seven yard two point conversion was probably dumb for Campbell, but the rest of what he's done, I think is, is time in, in, in Detroit smart. When you have that mindset, I think of always being aggressive, it, it permeates to the team, right? The team is always going for, it. we're always good. We're, you know, again, at the end of that game, they threw the ball in third and seven. How many teams just clam up, run the ball for two yards and punt? No, 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 not like, let's be aggressive. Let's, I think that mindset just permeates itself through the team and you prepare differently throughout the week, knowing you're always going for it. You're always going to score points. You're always moving forward. And I think that's kind of the lesson from, from, from Dan Campbell here. So um, it'd be great. It'd be super. I mean, imagine that lions and Niners. I mean, imagine the Packers win that game. You get lions Packers in Ford field for a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Um, I, I don't think. Jared, I don't see Jared Goff. It, it'd be Brock Purdy, Jared Goff too. I'd be like, one of those guys going to be a Super Bowl. I mean, like, it, it's. I mean, look at the NFC. You have, you have Brock Purdy, Jared Goff, Baker Mayfield, and you have uh, Jordan Love. In the AFC, you have Lamar, Allen, Mahomes, and uh, C.J. Stroud. It's a much different quarterback uh, class depending on on what on what conference you're in. There's no doubt. All right, Super Bowl pick. What do you got? 
Um, hmm, good question. I think the Niners win the Super Bowl this year. I think it's sort of lining up perfect for them to, to get it done this season. I never thought Brock Purdy was Super Bowl winning quarterback, but when everyone's healthy for that team, they're they're hard to beat. Um, I maybe am a little bit of an elitist too with the one seed thing, but I think both one seeds are there. I it, that buy is so important. And we've seen until Tampa Bay did it uh, with Tom Brady as a five seed. Most of the most of the last ten years, the team with the buys are in the Super Bowl. It's a big advantage. You play one less game, you're healthier, um, less less obviously travel. You're at home, and and that tends to pay off. So I could see sort of Niners against the Bills probably, or or the or the or the Ravens. I think are the the option there. I, I think mean, Niners win the Super Bowl this season. What's the matchup you'd want if you could if you could hand oh. select? I mean, would, wouldn't like a Lions Bills just be like incredible? Yeah. The atmosphere in Vegas would be just incredible. Like that would be, I mean, the Bills obviously yeah. incredible. Uh, uh, you want? <laughs> I would, I would say combustible environment. Oh yeah, there were a lot, a lot, a lot of alcohol would be consumed in I Las think Vegas. Every single person in Detroit, in the maybe in the entire state of Michigan, would descend upon Las Vegas. It would be, it would be one of those where, you know, we used to get tickets as players. We get two tickets, obviously, for Super Bowl. And you would try to resell them. Don't tell anyone that we did this. this is, it, it never happens. Um, and there were some years when you got, you know, just a little bit of money, and some years we got a lot of money. This would be a lot of money game. I mean, you would, you would, you'd have to, so you have to fly typically to back to your home city and pick up the tickets or get them at at on site. And it would be worth every cent to fly to Vegas, pick up your tickets, sell them to someone. I mean, you're going to get five grand, six grand a ticket if it's, it's Lions Bills. I mean, every person who is a fan of that that team will descend on that city. So that's probably the most fun, I think, right now, the teams that are left, just from storyline and the city and the fan bases. Uh, you know, Niners and Packers have done it before. Chiefs obviously have done it before. Ravens have won, you know, recently enough. Um, that would be the most fun, I feel like. Can't let you run without talking some college football. All right. How how are you how are you feeling right now? Your Oregon Ducks were able to keep Dan Lanning. Yeah. But the Pac-12 is no more. We're we're transitioning from the 14 playoff to the 12 team playoff. Just yeah. how, how are you feeling about college football right now, big guy? A lot of change, you know. Um I still follow obviously the the, the Pac-12 teams uh, you know, very closely and it just you know with with one retirement of Nick Saban I mean, teams out west, just the turmoil of of Washington losing a coach, Arizona losing a coach, San Jose State losing a coach. Now, it's a it's a lot. It's a lot of moving parts of college football. Now, um, the transfer portal. It's a different sport to to follow. But look, I'm Morgan Duck, man. It benefits us. We got money. We we got a good coach. Like we're we're getting good players. We're really good. So, it's not something that I I don't think I liked in. In totality, but I like it for my team. <laughs> I, I certainly follow it. It makes our job tougher, but also so much more to talk about at all times. Um, and it's a different sport than it was. I, I think eventually we might go back to. I think that the schools that have left out west are going to realize the Olympic sports have no business flying across the country to play their games. And what Chip Kelly suggested a month ago about sort of a football conference and everyone else goes back to basically playing regional is I think what's going to end up happening. I think after three or four years, Oregon, Washington, USC, I'm like, why are we flying to, to, to state college to play a volleyball game against Penn state? Like, what are we doing? That's, that's, that's dumb. L let's go back home and play teams out West, you know, flying to go play Rutgers and soccer. Like why, who needs that? Who's actually wanting that keep football, let them play their big. The football schedules are great. Organize Michigan and Ohio State next season and Washington. It's great. This is they're awesome football games. We're at Wisconsin in like no late November before Thanksgiving. How cool is that going to be? Um, but there's no need for those other sports to participate in this. I think that's what direction we're going in. And change in college sports is happening fast, man. The portal is is accelerating things. I mean, Caleb Downs just went to the portal while, while we've been talking. Alabama safety is going to have any team he wants to go to. So a lot, a lot of new things. Um, and uh, it's, it's fun to follow a little stressful at times, but that's the sport now. And, it, you know, Nick Saban, he's done everything. He could retire whenever he want, but I, 
the timing it has something to do with what's going on for yes. sure. It's it's so much more difficult for the team to stay on the very top. Like no one, I don't think anyone's going to have a run like he had again. At least under this current situation, you know, the NIL transfer portal, the schedules. Alabama's about to play an unbelievable schedule. It's very very tough. Do you yeah. think it's going to work with Kalen DeBoer there? Um. Saban retired for the same reason that, you know, that, you know, uh, Jay Wright and uh, Bayheim and all the, you know, all the, all, Krzyzewski, all these coaches of, these older coaches have left. Chris Peterson, obviously, very clearly, you know, can still coach, didn't want to do it. It's hard. It's a lot of time and energy. It's a young man's game now. It's a young, you have to be on the phone and and on these recruits and, 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 and recruiting your own players. And it's a lot. And and I think he's just like, look, I've done my job. I've, I've lost about to Alabama in a better place. I'm going to be done and, and go out on my terms. A lot of people, a lot of coaches go out like Belichick. You finish three and 13 and you're like, you got to go, buddy. I'm sorry. Saban went out, not on top, but this is might've been his best coaching season. That team was not as talented as his team he's had in the past. Kalen DeBoer is interesting. Um, Michigan in overtime. And what? If, if they would have beat Michigan in overtime and then happened to maybe win the championship, do you, you think he's still done? Yeah, I think he, I think that this was sort of known yeah. around Thanksgiving. It, it, Washington athletic director, uh, they had their press conference for Jed Fish yesterday. And he said something like, we knew by Thanksgiving, Keelan DeBoer was not signing his extension because they, they offered him a new extension. He never signed it. And that's sort of, I feel like, what people sort of knew. I think these coaches, Sark and Norvell and Lanning, they knew about Alabama being open before it was. And they all sort of said no before they even got the chance to get down the road. And they used it, obviously, for recruiting, which is great. It's, it's what you should do. But they all they all knew. They knew this was happening for weeks. And so I don't think winning that game or losing would have mattered very much at all. I think he was out no matter what. Kalen DeBoer has won everywhere he's been, guys. Everywhere he's been, he wins. Um, the recruiting is the biggest question. He didn't recruit terribly well at Washington. Uh, can he recruit the best players to win at Alabama? That, that's the question. If he can do that, they're going to win. I don't – this fit thing, like – I mean, Nick Saban wasn't a fit at LSU. To like, to, I mean, like, what are we doing? Like, it, you, you're not a fit till you get somewhere. Um, and you figure it, figure that out. You know, he's not doing the fake Southern accent, which is good, the Brian Kelly. Uh, and, and, uh, to, but fits fits a dumb thing to say. Oh, does he fit? I don't know. He wins football games. That's what matters. And if he wins football games, he'll fit just fine. So to me, it's recruiting. It's can he recruit? Um, offensively, you know, I, I put money on Jalen Miller to be a Heisman finalist right now. I mean, this is what he does with this offense. Um so good hire, can coach, got to recruit better. We'll see how he does Alabama with that. Jeff, enjoy the trip to Buffalo. Uh, Barbell Tavern for Wings, undoubtedly the best. Are you going to come now? I'm going to explore the options. That's what I'm going to do, buddy. I, cool. I will, uh, I'll get to work on that. I'll see what I, it, it all comes down to my wife. You know how that works. I feel like, I feel like you can get, you can get a better opportunity to be in a box than I can. So just remember me. I need two. I need two tickets in the box. Okay. I <laughs> I still know some people there, so we'll uh we'll explore the options, and I'll let you know for coming. But you're the best man. Thanks for the time. And Thank you guys. Enjoy the game. Take care, man. Jeff is gonna have so much fun in Buffalo. Oh my gosh, I'm so jealous. Yep, that's gonna be a fun game. Now, two of the best quarterbacks going at it. Two cold weather teams. You don't think the weather's gonna be much of a factor there? So, um, that's gonna be awesome. No doubt about it. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the week. But first, all you grill masters, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers premium quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D-I-D-I-E-R, Ranch.com, to order one of their premium quality beef boxes and use promo code OKLAHOMA15 for 15% off your order. Filet, ribeye, New York strips, sirloin, steak burgers. They got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans get their deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O-line and D-line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Didier Ranch, tradition tastes better. And John Vance Auto Group has a deal for Oklahoma Breakdown listeners. Go to any of their nine full-service dealerships in Woodward, Miami, and Guthrie. Tell them we sent you, and they'll give you $500 off. That's $500 off just because you listen to this podcast. They've been serving Oklahomans for 40 years. They're family-owned and operated, and no matter what your vehicle needs are, 
John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way. You can find all the information about their lifetime loyalty program, browse their entire inventory, and find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? EA Sports. Now, EA Sports has not verified, but there's a couple of different people out there saying that they've got a date for whenever the video game is going to drop. NCAA football, July 12th. And that matches up with some of the dates that they've dropped the game in the past. Uh, It's been a long time. I think the last time was 2013, whenever they dropped NCAA 14. And uh, I know there's a bunch of people been waiting. Be a decade. So, um, I'm excited about it. My son's of age now, plays Madden. Uh, would love to see him playing some college football. I'm excited about it. Yeah, I am. I'm pumped. Can't wait. The game's been gone for far too long. You mentioned that NCAA 2014. I was on that game. I was on the last one. It's my senior year. I was one of the only guys in the nineties. What's up <laughs> on our team? No big deal. It, and it's funny that actually got me street cred in the locker room. It really did. It's like, nice. Oh, nice Gabe. Nice. But is it bad that I'm still skeptical? It's going to happen, man. I just, there's, no, I, know. I know the legal implications with NIL. Now all the moving parts. I, I it is, this is the situation. I'm not going to believe the game is back until I'm playing it. And I'm not a video game guy. I'm not. I don't I can't tell you the last time I played a video game. But I just it seems like there's a lot of hoops to jump through. I I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm I know. I'm optimistic, but I'm just going to need to see it before I believe it. That's where I'm at with it. I uh, I'm totally with you. It seems like an absolute mess. Um you know, I want the players to, you know, to get a piece of it. I want, I want, you know, the people that deserve a, a piece of the action to get a piece of the action. But here's the other part of it. If you polled all the college football players, it'd be like 99% would say, I don't care what we get. If it's $10, if it's $0, if it's a hundred dollars, if it's $500, I just would love to play the game with myself on there, you know, and that's how it kind of has always uh, was previously. And there's going to be a bunch of people quickly come running to tell all of those guys how bad they're getting screwed and, you know, that they shouldn't allow it and all this stuff. But I think that's ridiculous. Um, Just, Enjoy having yourself on a video game. Don't let lawyers and everyone else tell you that you shouldn't allow it to happen. Hey, players, don't ruin it for yourselves and don't ruin it for all of us, okay? I I gladly played that game and I made $0 from it. I think we actually ended up getting paid down the road for it because of the abandoned situation. But the it's just cool. I I got whatever you get, you get. I think it's the same year they called me and they had like a legends something on there and they were offering, I can't remember how much it was. It was like 500 bucks. And I was like, sure, whatever. I mean, do it. I don't care. I, I don't. It's five hundred dollars. That's awesome, but I don't even care about that. Like, I just I think it's cool that you have that availability on there, and 
I don't know. If they can give the guys something, it's awesome. But I don't think there's as much money there as people think whenever it comes to those those video games um, and the numbers that they do. But I know this. I think it's a huge driver for college football, interest in college football. I think you bring a lot more people to the table that uh, end up having an interest in the sport because of the game. Completely agree. I think it's for for the overall health of college football. I think the game coming back is great, especially with everything we got going on. I think it's great. Who do you have as your loser of the week? I got to go with Alabama. Now, I think the transition has gone well. Um, it sounds like they're they're putting together a really good sa- uh, staff feels like they've held on to a good chunk of the roster there, but they've also lost some guys and Caleb Downs has jumped in the portal. Doesn't mean Mm. that he's gone, right? Still has the ability to stay. But if, if Alabama loses one, two, three, five of these guys, I think it's going to be more difficult than it's ever been to replace some of those guys. It's not going to be just the nonstop pipeline that it's been before. And, you know, given that they're going to have probably the most difficult schedule that Alabama's had in the last 20 years, maybe ever going into this year. And the roster may be not as good as it's been. You're, you're really starting to line yourself up for perhaps Uh, come back down to earth and join the rest of college football. For those of you that are not familiar with Caleb Downs, he, he started at safety, which is a very difficult position in Nick, in Nick Saban's defense as a true freshman stud and was a second team all American. I think he was second team AP all American as a true freshman and may have been the best player on their defense. As a true freshman, I, I wonder if it's just a situation where he looked at it and said, I'm so good. I'm going to ball in whatever defense I play in. Who wants to pay me the most money? I'm sure. It is the times. Would not be shocked if he ends up at Georgia. Oh, that one's going to be painful. It's going to be painful. Painful for Bama fans. and. And that team, and and maybe that's the case. I don't know, but you can't you can't lose these players. Like, and I know it's not a mass exodus. I understand, but man, it, it's just these guys are so hard to replace now. It's more competitive on the recruiting trail, especially with all the change that you're going to have. So, I don't know, man. I. I, it's it's getting it's starting to look like it's going to be more and more difficult down the stretch and it's going to be Alabama is still going to be incredibly good it's just going to I think their incredibly good is going to look a lot more like some other really good teams and not going to look like the juggernaut that they've been yeah I I don't know if you can really say anything to anyone in Alabama. Texas is going to keep giving guys Lamborghinis. <laughs> I can't keep Isaiah Vaughn. Did you see that? No, I haven't seen that yet. He, he came out, Isaiah Vaughn, who, remember, he was the one who caught the, what was it, fourth and 31 yeah. against Auburn late in that game, caught it in the corner of the end zone. He's a really good player. Dude can run. But transferred to Texas said it was a business decision. And I think one day later it was Snapchat or Instagram or one of those things. He posted a picture of him sitting in a Lamborghini college football. Now, baby, let's go. It was a a business decision and business is good. And business is good. But, and you mentioned it. Yes. It's a week where Alabama loses a couple of key players to the portal. And I guess they haven't technically lost downs yet, but it, it, it seems like that is a real possibility. But DeBoer, he is putting an interesting staff together. He got Kane, I think you say it, Womack, 
South Alabama's head coach to leave to come be his defensive coordinator. And then he got Maurice Linguist, who's the head coach at Buffalo, to leave. He got two guys to leave head coaching jobs to be on his staff. That's that's pretty dang significant. So kind of a you know a, a week of highs and highs and lows for Alabama fans host Nick Saban. Yeah, and I don't know a whole lot about the background for those guys, but I'm sure they are probably more regionally tied to that spot than he is, which I think is big. I, you you need some guys that are well versed in the recruiting circles down there, and and like they're going to be set up. They're back end recruiting. Uh, the the organization that they've got there is top notch, but you still need some familiar faces down there. No doubt. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. But first. Elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment in Oklahoma City. Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that will give you all the power you need so you can take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. Oklahoma owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495. 1722 or visit chapelsupply.com that's c h a p p e l l supply.com and attention business owners you need insurica in your life insurica is one of the largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout oklahoma texas and the southwest insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers they compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to OpolisClothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. You can see where I spilled water all over my shirt. I lifted it up. I was like, oh, dang it. I've showed everyone. Oh, no. For my winner of the week, thought about going with Sharon Moore. It feels with Harbaugh interviewing for all these NFL jobs, and then you've got the reports that he's trying to get basically immunity at his contract if he comes back to Michigan, all this weird stuff. It just feels like he's gone to Mm -hmm. me. He's interviewed with the Chargers. He's interviewed with the Falcons. It just seems like the NFL is the next step for Jim Harbaugh, and there's a lot of discussion around who's going to be the next guy for Michigan, and I think people are overthinking it. I, I think it's going to be Sharon Moore, and he's going to be the next head coach at Michigan, in my opinion. And that's pretty dang cool. Yeah. Well, I'm with you. They don't – I almost feel like they don't even have much of a choice. You won a national championship. Your offensive coordinator was was at the helm often throughout the season because of Harbaugh being suspended. I I don't I don't think you want to change really the operation of what's gone on there. You want to keep as much continuity as you can. I if if it's not Sean Moore, then you're right. They're overthinking it. And I think they're making a big mistake. I I to to shut him out after the year that they just had seems ridiculous. I guess it could end up being Jesse Minner, the defensive coordinator, but I don't know. It just feels like it's going to be more. But for my winner of the week, I'm annoyed about it. Los Angeles. Yeah. Stupid, stupid Los Angeles. Thunder went out to L.A., got beat by the Lakers, got beat by the Clippers. Let's start with the Clippers game because uh, that one happened most recently. It's the second night of a back-to-back. The Clippers are playing really good basketball. And it was a wildly entertaining game. I would not mind a playoff series between these two teams. Sign me up for that. But the fourth quarter, you know, just emotional swing for me watching it in bed. Thunder turned it on in the fourth. Jalen Williams, 
he was awesome doing everything for the Thunder in the fourth quarter. But he hits a three with about three minutes and 38, three minutes, 37 seconds to go to give the Thunder a 115-114 lead. And the Clippers kind of just completely outplayed the Thunder from that point on. And a big reason why, Paul George is really good at basketball. God just closed the game. He was hitting threes. He picked SGA from behind, then went and, you know, did a one-handed kind of reverse, goes underneath and dunks it. 18 points in the fourth quarter, had a ton of points in the second half, had 11 of the last 14 for the Clippers, just took the game over. And, And unfortunately, maybe the best stretch we've seen from Paul George all season long was against the Thunder, and he's the reason that Thunder are leaving Los Angeles winless, Ted. Made me real sad. That was that was a great game, though. It was really, really fun to watch. That fourth quarter was was highly entertaining. I just wish the Thunder would have finished stronger because the Clippers kind of won it going away with what Paul George was able to do there late. You know, and it's kind of the one thing like the Clippers have something that the Thunder just don't have. They've got late game, like big time late game experience. Guys that have played a ton of basketball uh, in highly competitive games, and you know where crunch time execution in the fourth quarter is absolutely critical. You just lack some of that experience right now, and and you know during the regular season some of that stuff's going to happen, but. All right, they got the Clippers got some of the best like late game stars that that you've got in the NBA at the moment. Yeah, you look at what Kawhi did late. You know, and SGA's layup against the glass had a tremendous contest on a fade that SGA missed. Clippers are good. Mm-hmm. Clippers are really good, and this is something we talked about last episode. Thunder going to get everyone's best shot in this game. It was a TNT game. You know, all the, all those guys know there are a ton of eyeballs on it, but I feel like the Clippers really turned it on and it, it almost had, it's hard to say in January, it had a playoff intensity feel to it, but Paul George is hitting shots and flexing and yelling at the crowd. Like that's the way it felt to me. Mm -hmm. They're going to get that type of effort from other teams now. And that type of intensity. And I I think you see, you saw that in the Lakers game as well. And the one thing, a a common theme of both games, Jalen Williams is about that life. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking for positives from losing both in LA, Jalen Williams was tremendous in both games and appears to be improving rapidly. Guy looks like he's going to be a star. I, I don't think there's a debate right now. Chet Holmgren's tremendous, but he struggled on that, on the, that back-to-back. The intensity, uh, just the way that everything was moving, like he, he did not play well in either game, especially in the Clippers game, just was, was not his night. But Jalen Williams on the other side, those games with that type of intensity, he looked like he was at his best. Yeah. And that's really, I mean, that's really exciting. So I am, I'm not concerned. It's a very, very long season. But when you look at that Lakers game, it was clear. The Lakers, that team is, they're huge. And their size, their physicality, but they outscored the Thunder by 20 points in the paint. I mean, they are, they're Big and the Thunder just have issues with that. Mm-hmm. Thunder settled for so many threes, shot 49 threes in that game mm. and 11 free throws. <laughs> so, not, it, which is that. just a little strange for them, but you know, Chet struggled in that game against Anthony Davis. Chet struggled, and, and that's something that he's going to learn from. So, I am, I'm not freaking out. Do I wish they would have been able to get a split out there? Absolutely. But SGA, you know, is he completely healthy or not? That's to be debated. 
A lot of people want to talk about the limp he has when he walks. That's how he walks all the time. It's how he's walked ever since he got here, which probably just tells you how many, how few nationally televised games the Thunder have played since he's been there. He's just always had that little, that little hitch in his walking gait. I don't know why, but overall, I'm going to choose to say, you know what? The Thunder's going to have to get used to the intensity that these other teams are going to bring in these games. And Jalen Williams was awesome. So those are my two main takeaways. I'm not worried about SGA. I'm not worried about Chet. He's going to adjust. But everyone's going to wonder, okay, who do the Thunder need to trade for now? People are going to start. That conversation is going to ramp up even more. And we'll see how it goes against a red-hot Utah on Thursday night. They've won 9-10. to I think their only loss was to the Celtics. Yeah, but that's a good one. But this is this is the new reality for this team. It, it's no longer when the Thunder come to town. It's guys aren't taking the night off. They're getting up for these games. And while I appreciate just how how this team fights, even when they get down, I, I just think that, that there's going to be an adjustment period to that. Yeah. No, I agree. And- that's it. Plus, you're going to be as as the season starts to wind down later. I imagine they're going to be in a lot more bigger nationally televised games, you know. And we'll see how you go from there. I, you're right, but that's good. You know, you need to get in the fire now because that's how it's going to be in the playoffs. And you know, they're probably going to go into the playoffs with a pretty decent seed unless things totally fall apart on them, and I don't see that happening. So you might as well start to get the battle tested now. Absolutely. All right, for my loser of the week, thought about going with Ohio State. Did you see they hired Ross Bjork to be their new athletic director? Yeah. Now, for those of you that don't know, Ohio State's athletic department brings in more money than any other athletic department in all of college sports. It's it's a big deal to run that athletic department. When you are the AD at Ohio State, you have a seat at the table every single time. And they gave the job to the guy that signed Jimbo Fisher to that horrible contract and had to buy it out. I I don't know, Ross Bjork. I've I've heard him talk several times. Seems like an extremely likable dude. He clearly is fantastic at Randy raising money. But the guy that signs Jimbo Fisher to arguably the worst college football contract in history is now going to be the most influential athletic director in all of college sports. Okay, sure. Yeah, and, you know, the timing on this deal is not a surprise, obviously. When did Gene Smith announce that he was was done? Yeah, a while back. back Before the season, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not like something all of a sudden is happening, but it still has to make you, I, if you're Ryan Day, it's it's not it's not great, you know, that the guy that was there that, you know, whenever you took over, like no longer your guy. And I'm sure that they're going to have a great relationship and all of that stuff. But, you know, with, with the fan base that is, um, I mean, I don't even know how you'd label them right now, but they are, they need to see something happen. They don't like to be on the sideline whenever the playoffs going on and watching Michigan play in the big 10 championship. So I, it's, it's an interesting time to be taking over AD at Ohio state, right? They need to have a good first year or everyone's going to know Ross Bjork's name all over again. It'll be interesting. It's crazy to think, though, maybe the most influential thing Ross Bjork's done in the last couple of years is leaked at OU in Texas for going to the SEC. Oh, I know. That was crazy. That that caused a lot of people a lot of headaches. Oh, my gosh. But we'll see. Hey, maybe he ends up killing it there. I, I don't know. But I was – maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I've – I just thought it was an interesting hire. But my loser of the week, OU basketball is playing, you know, and I know they've lost a couple in a row, but there's a lot of excitement about that team. 
Uh, the Thunder, maybe the buzziest team in the entire NBA with the way that uh, things have gone for them early in the season. And then you have my loser of the week, Oklahoma State basketball. Struggling, Ted. The Cowboys are struggling. Uh, got dismantled by Kansas on Tuesday night in, in a game that can only be described as non-competitive. They never led in the game. Just wire-to-wire -wire dominance from the Jayhawks. And I love Mike Boynton. I've been fortunate enough to interview him a lot uh, on, on the radio. He's great. He seems like he's about all the right things. But it's a results-driven business. They're 8-9 and nine on the season. They're 0-4 in conference play. They're undoubtedly, in my mind, they look like the worst team in the Big 12. And maybe the biggest indictment is what that crowd looked like when Kansas came to town. Maybe half full there at Gallagher Iba. And I'm probably had a lot of Kansas fans there too. If I know Kansas. Things are not good on the hardwood in Stillwater. And I I don't know. It just I don't I, they have, isn't he on a massive contract with a huge buyout? I'd be lying to you if I said I knew. I think he is. I just, it, it doesn't look the way that it should look. Now, do I expect Oklahoma State to be some dominant force in the Big 12, which is clearly the best conference in all of college basketball? No, but I expect them to be competitive at home. And you look at what the first couple of weeks have looked like, it has been very difficult to win on the road in this league. And... They provided very little resistance to Kansas. And Kansas is better than them. They're more talented than them. I get that. But didn't even give them a game. Man, and yep. fans aren't showing up. I just, I guess if you're looking for bright spots, Bryce Thompson's scoring at a good clip. It's, it's good to see him playing well. Javon Small, he's been good. Now, he was a no-show in the Kansas game. But I don't know, man. It just... Things are not going well right now for that team. Yeah, and it's 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 hard to figure out why. And I'm I'm sure some people have have the answers. I don't know. I'm I'm not close enough to it to know. But when you just look at the landscape of the Big Twelve, you'd think it would be where Oklahoma State basketball would thrive, right? I mean, there's there's a lot of really good teams in this conference. I I don't know why Oklahoma State's not one of them. I mean, Iowa State, TCU, Tech. I mean, you can go up and down, and like that. That Oklahoma State has been that type of program in the past, and you feel like right now should be a a good opportunity for them to to get back in, in the hoops game and, and make some, Hey, being in a great conference, but I don't know. That's it's, it's strange. I don't know. I know it wasn't good whenever they got screwed by the NCAA. I mean, no doubt that, that set them back for sure. But yeah, I also saw it didn't help things. They were getting made fun of all over X. Do you see they were giving away popsicles and soft pretzels to students to show up for the Kansas game? It's like 200 popsicles and two soft pretzels. Be there. Just like, wait, what? Interesting. I, hmm. I, I would love, I would love to show up to a game and get a free soft pretzel. That'd be awesome. But I don't, I don't know. A lot of people, there are a lot of, a lot of quote tweets on that one. It doesn't really hit the spot like mentally whenever it's zero degrees outside. You it's know, it's circle. simple. Beer. Give <laughs> yeah. the children beer. I Did you children. hear? Porter Give Mosa the young adults the, beer. The the two dollar beer quote that he had. Was oh yeah, good. Porter. Yeah. Make sure that uh, they don't have to wait in long lines. <laughs> That's, That's right. Pretty. Guy gets it. Uh, yeah, we'll see. It's. It's a big week for, for the Sooners to get back on track, but yeah, man. Not looking good in Stillwater.
birthday shout outs. We only got one. Happy 28th birthday to Mason O'Brien. And on that note, episode 388, we're getting close to 400, dude. Four bills. Soon. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Sunday. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy on The Ref. You can hear me on Sirius X and Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend. And until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.